If I may be so bold to ask you, would you lend your ear to me?
to Calvary Chapel McDonough, all of you on the web and at home in your jammies with your coffee. And um, so let's pray as we enter into worship of our Lord. Father, we just uh, come to you this morning. We are so grateful uh, to be in your presence, to sit at your feet, and to just adore you this morning with our songs of worship. And I just pray, Lord, that you would um, draw us by your Holy Spirit into the throne room, Lord, that we may adore you and exalt you and lift up your name on high. In Jesus' name, amen. is on. 
For being our good father you are perfect in all your ways and your thoughts that you think towards us are good and lord your ways and your thoughts are higher than ours and lord we can trust you you're our good and sovereign god we just pray lord this morning that as we open your word lord that you would conform us to your image make us more like you god and just root those things out of our lives that are not pleasing to you Lord, open up your words to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, Calvary Chapel McDonough. Uh, welcome to church at your house this morning, and we hope you're having a, 
Uh, great morning, got a cup of coffee or whatever you like, maybe Red Bull, I don't know. Uh, beautiful day outside. Um, what, a, what a fantastic fall day to close uh, this long weekend, a long Thanksgiving weekend. And um, what a great time of worship. Uh, thank you guys all for coming out and doing that. Um, just a few quick announcements. If you have a prayer request, on the website right there, there's a, there, one of the tabs. Uh, you click prayer request, uh, and you just type in. You can put your name. You don't even have to put your name, but you can put your name, and you don't have to fill out all the other information. Just put, type in the prayer request, hit send, and then it gets forwarded out to the whole uh, prayer team, to everybody that's subscribed. If you're not subscribed to that, you can do that right there, too. You just put in your email address and hit submit, and then you will receive uh, the prayer requests when they come out. And we don't have that many. It's not like you're going to get loaded up with 20 a day. Um, not that that would be a problem, but uh, it's usually just a few uh, a week, maybe. And so um, feel free to, to get in on that. So we want to hear your prayers. Also, if you want to give this morning, there's a tab for that, too. We don't want to uh, prevent you from doing that. If you feel like you want to uh, make a tither offering, you can do that right on the screen. It's very secure. Uh, when you click on it, it actually goes to the secure website. It looks like ours, kind of, but you just, again, put in your information. And you can set up monthly things. Uh, that's what I do. It, I just set it all up, and it just now it just does it automatic. So um, it's very uh, helpful. Well, this morning, we are going to pick up in Romans chapter 13. And if you would, turn there to Romans chapter 13. And we're going to pick up in verse 8 and finish the chapter. And let's pray, and then we'll get started. Lord, we just thank you uh, for this day. What a beautiful day. And Father, we just ask that your blessing uh, upon us as we look at your word right now. Um, maybe some difficult things here. Uh, hard to understand, Lord. Hard to really uh, know the, how to really put this into practice. Uh, and Lord, so I'm asking for, for your guidance, your direction for each one of us, Lord, that we would uh, have an understanding on how we can do what you're asking us to do. Lord, you're asking us to love uh, one another. And, and Lord, um, that can be incredibly difficult at times. And so we, we just I'm just asking that you give us that direction, that guidance, Lord, the, the how. How do we do this, Lord? So as we look at your word right now, uh, Father, uh, give us understanding, give us direction, and help us uh, to put this into practice, Lord, and because that's why you're telling, the, telling us to do it. And so, Lord, guide us right now as we look at your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Render means to supply, to provide, to furnish, uh, give something useful or necessary. Uh, in the beginning of chapter 13, Paul instructs every person to be in subjection to the governing authorities because all authority comes from God, and those that exist are established by God, even if we don't like them. Paul continues and says that because of this, because we are in subjection to them, we are to pay taxes. And then in verse 7, Paul says to render or supply or provide or furnish to all what is due to them. Romans 13 verse 7 says, render to all, to all, what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, owe nothing to anyone, the beginning of verse 8. Uh, we as believers in Jesus, we are to render or pay to all what is due to them. We are to owe nothing to anyone. Now, this verse can be taken out of context very easily. Is Paul saying that we as Christians are, should not have a mortgage or a car payment or take out any loan whatsoever? No, he's not saying that at all. Paul's not saying that we should not borrow. In fact, let's look at what Jesus says about borrowing in Matthew chapter 5, verse 42. He says, Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him, him who wants to borrow from you. And so Jesus is not condemning borrowing. And so what is Paul saying when he says to owe nothing to anyone? Well, remember, Paul says this in the context of rendering to all what is due them. If you have a mortgage or a car payment or a loan, um, when you receive the bill this month, what does the bill say is due to them? 
Is it the entire sum of the loan, or is it this month's payment that is due to them? Well, it's this month's payment, right? Ideally, a loan uh, is beneficial to both parties, uh, to the bank or business that loans the money and to the person that receives the loan. Both parties agree on a certain amount of interest to be paid. Both parties agree on a length of the time to repay the loan. Both parties agree on a payment schedule, how much will be paid per installment over the length of the loan. And uh, so this gives the average person the uh, opportunity to purchase a home or a vehicle. And it also gives the bank or an institution a way to earn money, to have a job, uh, uh, employment as long as the borrower is making the payments in accordance with their agreement. Uh, it's a win-win situation for both parties. However, it's not a good situation when the bill comes and we fail to render what is due to them. And this is what Paul is talking about. Do not enter into a loan agreement that you can't make good on. In my personal experience, the bank is always under the impression that I can afford way more than I know what I can afford. You see, they run their little calculations. I don't know how they do it. They take your monthly income. They minus any other loans you might have, minus utility bills. And then they offer me a loan that takes up the rest. And in the past, I've had to inform these guys that, you know, hey, I pay my taxes. And that takes a large portion out of my paycheck. I'm sure you're all aware of that as well. Uh, I have to inform them that my body requires food. Granted, I often give it more than it requires, but it does require purchasing food to consume every day. I have to inform them that I might, even if I don't have a loan on a vehicle, it still requires gasoline on a daily basis. It requires the tires to be replaced. Be replaced. It, uh, if it breaks down, it's got to be repaired. I inform them I might like making charitable contributions, tithes and offerings, or supporting missionaries, or even maybe giving to an organization that supports a fatal disease or a physical ailment. There's so much expense in life that the bank does not calculate into their figures. So I would highly recommend that you do not extend yourself to what the bank says you can afford. They don't allow for any wiggle room whatsoever. And this is what Paul is basically saying. Don't overextend yourself. Don't enter into a loan that you know you will not be able to meet the required payment schedule. You know, there is always a less expensive house. There's always a less expensive car. Uh, and certainly, there will be compromises that have to be made. I mean, there's a reason the price is less. But what good is having a certain vehicle when you can't afford to put gas in it? Or, you know, what good is a big fancy house with a big fancy refrigerator that you can't afford to put food in? Uh, it's been said, so often we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Paul is not saying that we cannot enter into a loan agreement. However, he is saying, make sure you have the ability to pay it back as far as you know. I mean, considering the current income you have. Now, not figuring, figuring in the proceeds uh, from winning the lottery next week, or not counting on being discovered by Hollywood or the NFL, your big break, or not hoping that great-grandpa finally kicks the bucket and leaves the inheritance uh, to finally make a right on that loan. Not even counting on the latest rumor at work that you might be the next one that gets promoted. Paul is saying, make sure you have the ability, as far as you know, to meet those monthly obligations. And then make sure you meet those monthly obligations. Now, you may be in a position where something changed. You know, you got laid off from work, you incurred unplanned medical expenses. There's no doubt things like this happen. That, that's why I believe it's good advice to borrow, not to borrow everything that the bank says you can afford, but kind of go the opposite. Borrow the minimum you need to borrow at the minimum interest rate you can get. Because things change. You might lose your job and you have to find another one, and chances are the next one might not start out paying as well as the last one, especially at first. Usually it takes you know, time to work up the pay scale, sometimes just to get back to where, what you were making at the previous company. It might be a couple of years. Um, some may call that lack of faith. I don't know. I, I, I call it counting the cost, as the Bible instructs. For example, you know, here in this area, in, in Atlanta, the metro area, uh, you need personal transportation. Uh, places like New York City or Chicago, they have very good public transit systems. Many people live and work and function in society without their own vehicle. Uh, here in our area, that would be extremely difficult. Uh, so it's safe to say that most of us, not everybody, but most of us require some type of personal transportation. And so it's safe to say that for most of us, that would be God's will that we would have this type of personal transportation. 
However, there's a wide range of price depending on the options, right? You might say that it's God's will that you have a brand new car. You might say it's God's will that you have more than the economical compact car. You might say that it's God's will that you have the gigantic oversized aluminum wheels with tires that look like a rubber band stretched over a coffee can, you know, uh, whatever. You might say that you, God's will is for you to have the Bluetooth navigation, uh, connects to your phone automatic, all of that great stuff, and, and that would be cool, and so on and so on. And there's nothing wrong with any of that, but that's between you and God, you know, and with everything, just, just not just cars, houses, everything. Uh, and I do firmly believe that when God guides, God provides. And so if God guides you to buy a particular car or a particular house, I firmly believe He will provide for that car and that house. And if God is no longer providing for that car or that house, maybe it wasn't the one Lord, the Lord intended, or maybe it was the one, but it is no longer the one. And the Lord wants you to, to uh, downsize, you know, time to, to move on. And so... Uh, just following the Lord's will on that. And we don't want to judge anybody for how the Lord's leading them on what, what they're purchasing. Uh, God instructs us through the Apostle Paul to render to all what is due. He instructs us to pay our monthly bills. And if you're unable to do that, maybe it's time to make some changes. You know, whether it's increasing the monthly income, decreasing the monthly bills. Uh, my family gave up cable television 17 or 18 years ago. Uh, we never had it in this house. Uh, we purchased an antenna for $70. And you know, if the cable bill was, some people tell me it's $100 a month, uh, that's over $20,000 over that time span. And you know, it's really not that bad. I only have to go through 20-something channels to find out there's nothing on instead of going through 700 channels to find out there's nothing on. Uh, last month, my son Parker, uh, purchased a running roadworthy vehicle with good tires on it for $800. Now, it's not pretty to look at, but it gets them to work and back safely and reliably. Um, there are lower priced options out there. That's the point. And so uh, when we start separating what we want from what we need, you'll find the price goes way down. There's a big, often there's a big difference between our wants and our needs. Um, and so we, we don't want to be overextended. So we're to, we are to render to, to what is due to all, owing them nothing, except, in verse 8, he gives us an except. Romans 13, 8, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there are any other commandments, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that amazing? Uh, last week in our study through Exodus, we're right here. What a coincidence. Again, you know, the Lord is so good. So the debt here that we cannot pay, the one that says accept, is loving one another. The implication here is we will always owe loving one another. The implication is we will never be done loving one another. Uh, this will always be due. No matter how much we render, we will never be finished with loving one another. Uh, we will never be done with that. It will always be the case. On into eternity, God will always require that we love one another. In Matthew 12, or 22, 37, we're told, And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. This is Jesus speaking. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends, depend the whole law and the prophets. They're all summed up in these two. James 2.8. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the royal law. You are doing well, James says. Galatians 5.14, where the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then John 13.34, a new commandment I give you, Jesus says, that you love one another even as I have loved you, so that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What we see over and over again here is this idea 
that if you really love someone, you're not going to murder them or you're not going to do these other hurtful things to them. And so if you love God and you love everyone else, you will not break any of the other commandments. You can't. It would violate the love. <clears throat> you might be thinking, well, it doesn't say everyone else, does it? It says one another. It says, love my neighbor. If you remember, they tried to pull that argument with Jesus, and then he told them the story of the Good Samaritan. The whole point of that story that Jesus was telling them was that the Jews' worst enemies, the Samaritans, were considered their neighbors. And so according to Jesus, everyone, including your worst enemy, is considered your neighbor, and we are commanded to love them. So what does this mean, to love them? Well, Paul lists a few ways that love is manifested uh, by these um, Old Testament commandments. He says in verse 9, For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the first thing Paul says is, is that we should love them, or to avoid a misunderstanding, let's say respect them sexually. What that means is if you really love others, you're not going to commit adultery. Uh, in the act of really loving, we're not going to commit adultery. In the act of loving our own spouse, in the act of really loving the other person, uh, you're not going to cause them to commit adultery with their spouse. If you really love their spouse, the other person's spouse, you're not going to commit this sinful act. And you know, and it extends on to children involved, uh, in these families, friends, family. These sins can be very far-reaching, affecting far more people than you can often imagine. Uh, even in, of course, we see that in uh, celebrities and pastors that, that stumble into sin, but just you, the regular person, there's, it affects a lot of people, a lot of co-workers, everybody. Uh, we also need to remember that fornication or sex outside of marriage is included in this. We also need to remember that Jesus said, if we lust after another person, we've committed adultery in the heart. And so if we really love someone, if we really respect them concerning sexuality, we're not going to lust after them. This includes pictures, photographs on the internet. It doesn't matter how the picture got there. Even if the person volunteered in their own lustful picture, for whatever reason, money, maybe they're seeking approval, maybe they're seeking real love, but just in a very misguided way. If we really love them as God commands us to love them, we won't disrespect them in that way, reducing uh, the image of a child of God. This is a child of God, reducing that image to something that our flesh and our sinful nature desires to lust after. If we really love others, we won't be sneaking a glance. We won't be taking a second look. We, we won't be reducing that person to a, a fuel the fire of our burning sinful desires. Again, even when it's done in secret, it, it still affects those around you. Uh, you can't disrespect a person in that way, even if it's just a photograph of them. And they have no idea. But you know. I know, you know, it, it changes you, it changes me, it, it changes how we love and respect everyone, because that is a person. And so, the first manifestation of this love is respecting people in reference to sexuality. Second, we're, not, we're to love or respect people in reference to their physical being, their physical life, not murdering them. Uh, and once again, Jesus took this one step further and said, if you hate someone, you've murdered them. You can't hate someone and love them. It's kind of opposites. And you know, God has wired us all differently. We all have a unique personality, and some of our personalities seem to get along better with other personalities. And I don't think that's a sin. Jesus himself, he selected 12 of his followers of the whole group to be apostles. And then out of the 12, he selected three, remember Peter, James, and John, to be a little more closer with. It doesn't mean Jesus, Jesus hated the other guys, just for whatever reason, he wanted to connect closer with this group of 12 and then even closer with this group of three. And so we can love and respect others physically without being their best or closest friend, however you want to describe it, but still respecting that God made us all, respecting the fact that we are all either sons or daughters of God or we're potential sons and daughters of God. Every single person in the world, you're either a son or daughter of God or you're a potential son or daughter of God. He paid the price for all of us. 
And He desires we would all come to repentance. That's God's will if we would simply accept it and repent. You know, think about a large family. There might be uh, some siblings, maybe a family that has 12 children. There might be some siblings that are closer to one another than others, and that's fine, as long as they're respecting all as their siblings, all loving them the same. Uh, A third way that our love can be manifested towards others is not stealing from them, uh, which is really stealing from God, uh, because God owns everything. In Psalm 24, 1 We're told the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. All it contains. The world and those who dwell in it. We, everything, belong to God. God owns everything. And He's given each of us stewardship of some things. So taking something that doesn't belong to us, first we're disrespecting God and His decision to put that item under the other person's stewardship. You know, like we know better than God does. But it's also disrespecting the other person. They were given stewardship of that, and taking that away from them is not loving them at all, is it? Uh, In a fourth way, our love can be manifested towards others by not coveting of them. Uh, Whether you want uh, the very thing they have for yourself so that they no longer have it, like that particular thing, or maybe you want a duplicate of that thing for yourself so you both have it. Uh, Either way, it's really not loving that person to have the... to harbor that. Uh, It's not loving God's decision to give that person whatever it is. And it's certainly not loving if you want to take that thing away from them. And not being content with what God has given us, that's disrespecting God and His authority and His decision-making process. Romans 13 verse 10 says, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this knowing the time." that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. It's all about really loving one another. Paul says, do this. He says, don't wait. You're almost out of time. The culmination of our salvation by Jesus returning, is closer than it was yesterday. It's closer than it was the first day that we believed. We're running out of time. So he says, let's lay aside the deeds of darkness. We just don't have time for that. We don't have time for sin. He says, let's put on the armor of light. We're running out of time. Verse 13 says, let us behave properly as in the day, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Paul says, let us behave properly as we do in the daylight, as we do in front of all. The opposite of what's done, you know, in secret and in the shadows and in the dark of night. Uh, Not in drinking parties. That's what the the, uh, carousing means. Uh, not getting drunk, not in sexual promiscuity, not preoccupied with sensual pleasure, uh, not in strife or contention, fighting, not in jealousy or suspicion or possessiveness. Uh, He says, let's behave properly, loving one another unconditionally. And so we've covered the what. What are we to do? We are to love one another with the godly love. It's the word agape. God-like love, unconditional love, not earned love. It's just just loving them, regardless. Uh, We covered the who. We are to love everyone. We covered the why, because God commanded us. And also, loving everyone fulfills all the commandments of God. Secondly, Jesus said, this is how people will recognize that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Not if you have lots of Bible verses memorized, Not if your hair is cut a certain way and you dress a certain way. Not if you pray publicly before every meal. Not even if you bless people when they sneeze. Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples if you love one another. And so that's why. That's the why. Why we need to do this. We've also covered when. Paul says the time is now. He said, wake up. We're running out of time. The return of Jesus is near. The opportunity for salvation is almost over. The time is now. So we've covered the what, the who, the why, the when, 
But there is yet still one enormous question that needs to be answered. How? How? How can you, how can I, a man born in sin with a sinful nature, how could I possibly love everyone unconditionally the same way that God loves them? How? I always want to know the how. Verse 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. This is the how. This is how we can love everyone in the world unconditionally. Simply put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Now, we are to make provision for our bodily needs. Our bodies need water and food and air and sleep. He's not telling us to disregard our health. He says, make no provision in regard to its lusts. In other words, if you have a tendency to overindulge in something, let's just say ice cream, for example, like me, then you probably wouldn't want to have four cartons of different flavored ice cream in your freezer right now like I currently do. (laughs) Hey, (laughs) this is not me preaching to you. This is God preaching to us. I'm in the same boat that you are in. God says, no temptation is overtaking you, but such is common to man. Our temptations are common. Every single one of us might not be tempted in every single way, but whatever many of you are tempted with, I am as well. And the things that I'm tempted with, many of you are tempted with those same ways. Paul says, make no provision for the flesh concerning its lust. Meaning, don't provide an opportunity to to feed the flesh. My office is right here behind me. You can see it. Behind these glass doors. And my computer monitors are facing the glass doors. Anybody in our house can easily see what's on my computer screens. There's not a lot of opportunity to look at something I shouldn't be looking at. If your smartphone is a problem, uh, don't bring it into the bathroom with you or don't bring it into a private situation. Make no provision for the flesh. Uh, Sometimes... Not providing that opportunity is way easier than fighting the battle. That you can end the battle right there by, by eliminating the opportunity. If junk food's a problem, don't fill up the fridge with it. You know, don't fill up the pantry with it. Uh, make no provision for the flesh. And again, I'm speaking to myself. It's a lot easier not to indulge in ice cream if there's none in there, right? Makes the decision, uh, you open the door, well, I guess I'm not having ice cream. Uh, I'll have a yogurt or whatever instead. Uh, so it's the same idea. If, if maybe if seeing what everyone else is doing, uh, I know this can be a problem on Facebook or Twitter or whatever the thing is. You know, you see every fun trip they go on, every exciting vacation, every fancy dinner they eat at. Uh, if that stirs up covetousness and jealousy, then stop looking. You're not going to get a thousand people to stop posting things. I mean, that's what those things are all about, people posting things. So just stop looking. Make no provision for the flesh in whatever area it is. Paul mentions two things as far as how we can love one another unconditionally. One is to make no provision for the flesh. The other is to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as awesome as that sounds, what does that mean? Right? I mean, if Jesus was a sweater... This makes total sense to me, right? It's a piece of cake. Just stretch him over the top of you. Pow, he's on. You know, let's go, right? Uh, But he's not a sweater. He's not a facade that goes over the top of us, making us look different than we really are. No, he is God Almighty in the flesh. You know, God Almighty, creator of the universe, transcended himself from his spiritual place into this physical world that he created. He's not a sweater. He's not a facade that we put over the top of us. To put Him on means we need to be put off. It's not over the top, it's in place of us. In Galatians 5.13, it says, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Verse 16, but I say, walk 
by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The Spirit and the flesh are at war with one another. They are in opposition to one another. The sinful nature is our flesh, and it is at war with God's nature, with the divine nature. 2 Peter Verse, or chapter 1, verse 4 says, For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, God's nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Through God's grace, we have become partakers of the divine nature, of God's nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world by its lust. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, And he was saying to them all, Jesus was saying, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. The cross was the method of execution during that time. If it was today, this could very easily read, sit in your electric chair daily and follow me. Daily. Sit down, throw the switch every day. He says, for the one who loses his life, the one that gives up his life, the one that executes his life for the sake of Jesus, he is the one that will save it, Jesus says. 2 Corinthians 5.16, therefore, from, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creature. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. The old things passed away. Passed away is what we, word we say for died, Right? Old things are dead. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself. God reconciled us to Himself. He did it through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. God used Christ to reconcile us to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. God doesn't count the sin against them, against us. And He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So now He's committed that to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. God is appealing to the world through us. For whatever reason, that's how He wanted to do it. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. He made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Do you see how all of these scriptures, they talk about our old selves that were directed and driven by our old sinful natures, and then there's this new life in Christ, uh, born in the Spirit, directed and driven by the Spirit of God through the Holy Spirit. And And how these are two completely different things. And they do not and will not coexist together. For us to love others unconditionally, we have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, not over the top of us, but to put Jesus on, we have to put ourselves off. In order to be born in the Spirit, our flesh needs to die. It needs to pass away. It needs to be crucified. It needs to be executed. Do you remember the what would Jesus do thing that was going a while back or many years ago now? And it wasn't a bad thing in and of itself. But the idea is, hey, I encounter a situation and I have a decision to make. And so I think, what decision would Jesus make in this situation? And I'll make that decision. But you see, according to these scriptures we just read, it isn't what would Jesus do in this situation. 
If Jesus is on and we are off, if we are partaking in the divine nature and our sinful nature is dead and buried, it's crucified, executed, then we have no decision to make. It's not what would Jesus do, it's what will Jesus do in this situation that he is in. What will Jesus do in and through me? Because I'm dead and buried. And it is Christ who now lives in and through me. But again, the question remains, how? How do I live like that? You know, I I believe God's Word when He says that the old nature is dead and it's buried and, and it no longer has authority over me. I believe that. I believe God's Word when He says that I am now partaking of the divine nature, of His nature. As incredible as that is, I believe it. I believe God's Word when He says that I've been born again. I believe God's Word when He says that I am a new creature and that the old man has passed away, that it died, that my old sinful nature is gone, dead, and buried. But why don't I always live like it? I believe all those things, but why don't I always live like that? I don't know. I really don't know. I I wish it was easy as, you know, turning a control switch. I'm thinking of like those old airbag, passenger airbag thing. You put in the key, turn the switch from me, turn it to God, pull that key out and throw it away. I don't know, but, but let me tell you what I do know. There are times, and it happens quite often, uh, that all of a sudden I stop, uh, whatever I'm doing, all of a sudden I stop and I think, how did I become pastor? You know, I don't know how to do this. And I think, oh my Lord, I'm going to be expected to have a sermon prepared this Sunday morning. And and, uh, even though it's been over six years, I'll get a little panicked thinking, "I, I can't do this. And so uh, I study up on the Scripture that I need to teach on, like usual, you know, read it, hear, listen to some guys teach on it. I pray that God will give me something to write down. And Saturday, I sit down at my desk and I start typing, start talking, and six or eight or ten hours later, I have a sermon written down. And it might not be great, it might not even be good, but I have something to bring. And... I'm absolutely amazed every single time. Every single week, I just wonder, how? How did this happen? And maybe that is the how. You understand? Maybe you and I, maybe we get up tomorrow morning, and maybe we do a little studying, or simply read a chapter, chapter a day. Maybe even just read a verse, a single verse. If you... They got those apps, the verse of the day, whatever. Maybe we say a prayer to God. That God will do it today. That God will live this life today. That He will give us the strength to stay off, to stay out of the way. And the strength to allow Him to stay on. And then we just start our day. And we just see what happens. And maybe at the end of the day, we'll sit back in amazement and we'll see what God did, what He did in and through us, yet once again. He's so faithful. Let's pray. Lord, I I just thank You for this Word and I thank You for this great command to love one another. Lord, and you tell us how by putting you on and taking us off, making no provision for the flesh. But Lord, we need help with that. And Lord, how does that actually fit my life and each one of our lives? We all have a little different thing, a little different schedule, a little different work, uh, whatever, Lord. Different temptations, different things. Lord, I ask that right now you would give us that direction, the how right now for our lives, for our, uh, this moment in time, for us, in our, each of our situations, that you would give us the how, how we can take ourselves out of the way and put you on and let you live in and through us. And so, Lord, that is our request right now, that you would give each one of us, each one here, each one watching online, Lord, 
that you would give that to us, that we would see the how, and then you would give us the strength to do it. Lord, you always supply what we need to do what you're calling us to do. So Lord, just give us that direction. Give us that insight. And Lord, be with us. Help us this week to allow you to live in and through us and just uh, do whatever amazing work you want to do, Lord, as we go out throughout our week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are good, you are good, and there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. Help us to um, just continually die to our own flesh and our own desires and live according to the love that dwells within us. Lord, you, Jesus, help us, Lord. Give us the power to do that this week and to glorify you in the process. We just pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Have a wonderful day in Jesus.